Welcome everyone. I'm Ellen Herman, co-director of the Wayne Moore Center and professor of history here at the University of Oregon. I'm so glad you could join us today, either in person or many of you Welcome who are everyone. following the live stream uh, for this celebration and discussion of an important new book, The Future We Need, Organizing for a Better Democracy in the 21st Century, just published by Cornell University Press. We are so fortunate to have both co-authors with us today, Sarita Gupta and Erica Smiley, as well as a commentator on the book, Margaret Halleck, who is well known to everyone in the Wayne Moore Center community. The mission of the Wayne Moore Center is to promote civic engagement, inclusive democracy and justice by bringing together students, scholars, activists, policymakers, and members of unions and communities people just like you. We discuss a wide range of issues affecting Oregon, our nation, and the world. We work in the tradition of Oregon Senator Wayne Morse, who believed that political independence and education were the building blocks of justice and democracy. Many of you know that Wayne Morse was a strong supporter of labor, and this event is part of the center's program on making work work. Uh, this is a theme that we began in fall of 2021 and that will last through the spring of 2023, one year from now. So if you aren't already on our mailing list and would like to hear about other events like this one, please sign up for our mailing list on our website. Throughout this theme, we have brought together key leaders in higher education, government, and grassroots community organizations and unions to engage with questions about the challenges facing working individuals and families now and in the future. At this particular moment, it seems obvious that the public choices we make about workers and work are at the very same time, the public choices that will shape our country's future as a democracy. So let me just quickly introduce the three participants in today's event and then tell you a little bit about the format so you'll know what to expect. Sarita Gupta, right here, <laughs> is the occupant of the 2021-22 Wayne Morris Chair for Law and Politics. We have just been thrilled to have her here with us in Oregon. She's a nationally recognized expert on the economic, labor, and political issues affecting working people. Sarita is currently vice president for US programs at the Ford Foundation, where she also directed, but I think maybe still directs, kind of <laughs> hybrid, <or> but <laughs> yes. trying to move away from directing the Future of Workers program. Before that, she was the executive director of Jobs with Justice for many, many years. In that role, she led the fight to build the power of working people on the ground, online, and in public policy and research. She was also the co-founder and co-director with Ai-Jen Fu of Caring Across Generations, which set out to change the way we think about, organize, and compensate caretaking labor in the United States. They defined caretaking as essential infrastructure long before the pandemic made it obvious to the rest of us that caretaking, still largely done by women, holds up the entire economy. Erica Smiley, who is joining us via Zoom, is the current executive director of Jobs with Justice, where she has been spearheading strategic organizing and policy interventions for nearly 15 years. Smiley has served in numerous leadership capacities at Jobs with Justice, including as senior field organizer for the Southern region and as organizing director. Prior to joining Jobs with Justice, Smiley organized with community groups and unions, such as the Tenants and Workers Support Committee, which is now called Tenants and Workers United in Virginia and SEIU Local 500 in Baltimore. Her career in social and economic justice began in the reproductive justice field, something she has in common with her <laughs> co-author, Sarita Gupta. She served as national field director for Choice USA, which is now titled United for Reproductive and Gender Equity, where she received the Young Women of Achievement Award. And then finally, Margaret Halleck, 
right over here, retired in 2015 as the founding director of the Wayne Morse Center for Law and Politics here at U of O. She had before that directed the U of O Labor Education and Research Center known as LERC. Uh, Margaret Halleck is an economist. She taught economics and worked for SEIU 503 where she led the struggle for pay equity for women workers. She also served as policy advisor to Governor Ted Kulangowski for labor, revenue, and workforce development. She currently serves on the boards of sponsors, which is a re-entry organization well known to many of us in this area, and Planned Parenthood Advocates of Oregon. So just a quick word so you'll know what to expect. Sarita Gupta and Erica Smiley are going to start us off with a conversation <laughs> with each other about the origins of the book and their goals uh, in for writing it. After that, Margaret Halleck will offer some comments about the book, um, and then we'll give uh, Sarita and um, Smiley time to respond to those comments, which may include questions, I don't know. And then <laughs> perhaps yeah. about you know uh, an hour from now, maybe 50 or 60 minutes from now, we will have time for questions and answers from all of you. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to the co-authors. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ellen, um, for everything that you and the whole team at Wayne Morris has done. It's been such an extraordinary few weeks for me to be here on campus um, and be part of this program. So thank you. Um, and let me, I, I should ask, is Smiley zooming it? Can we see it, Smiley? Will we be able to see Smiley on screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Because we're going to go into a conversation now between Smiley and I. Um, and so I just, again, want to thank the Wayne Morris Center for hosting us and for hosting this event. And so as you heard, our book actually launched while I've been out here, which is really exciting. And um, wanted to start off, Smiley, I thought we could just share a little bit about why we decided to write this book in the first place. So, you know, just the top lines to get us kicked off and then you should chime in is um, we really wanted to share our understanding of the possibility of building power for working people um, and building a healthy democracy. You know, as two women, uh, women of color who have been in the labor movement for quite for many years now, um, and who had the real good fortune of working at an organization like Jobs with Justice, where we really work, it's a national network of labor community, faith-based and student organizations around the country. Um, we really had this unique opportunity to work at those intersections, which meant we were also in a really unique opportunity to help seed new efforts and initiatives and approaches to organizing. And I think we realized that after so many years, there was some real value in calling the lessons we've learned to share, but also to help tell a more coherent story of the evolution of the labor movement in the United States and globally. Um, it'd be so easy to see this moment of Starbucks workers in motion and Amazon workers and you know digital workers at the New York Times and Google tech workers organizing as just random. And actually, by the way, this morning, if you missed it, National Women's Soccer League, who has a wonderful collective bargaining agreement, which is really exciting. Exciting to me as a, as a soccer player, as a former uh, coach, my daughter's team. Um, but this, it'd be so easy to take this moment and really see it as random versus actually there are strategies that are being tested and tried. Um, and that's really what Smiley and I attempted to do in this book is tell the story of what are those strategies, who's leading testing some of these strategies, and how is it now um, expanding beyond whether it's domestic workers or it's day laborers or it's you know home care unions you know there's lots of different ways in which these strategies are developing so we wanted to thread the lessons together and to tell a really different story of how all these struggles are adding up and forging the future that we need um, and we really thought it was important to lift up the importance of collective bargaining as a means by which we implement democracy in the economy um, so maybe that's a good segue to you smiley if you want to talk a little bit about why you felt compelled to write the book um, and maybe some of our core messages. 
Yeah, no, I'm so grateful, Sarita, and um, and thank you so much. Oh, wait, Sarita. I think we can't hear you. Oh, dear. Okay. Let me just change my uh, audio. That's not good. You're good to go. You can hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. I was scared. I was like, oh, dear. Okay. Of course, we can't have, it's not COVID if there's not like a crazy technology snafu. Um I, I just was saying that I am sad that I can't be there in person, and I'm grateful to the Wayne Moore Center for always giving us platforms to talk through some of these issues, even before the book was out, and just so much gratitude for Ellen and Margaret and the team there, um, and hopefully one day we will, I will get out there uh, to hang out, but um, yes, Rita, you said a lot of it, and I guess like in addition to giving, before we dive into the conversation, in addition to giving some thanks to the Wayne Moore Center, I also want to thank Sarita, because this was a crazy endeavor, and I remember first coming to Sarita and being like, we got to write this down, like this is, we got to get this out of our heads, like people don't understand what we're talking about, and like I'm tired of reading all these books by these amazing women and women of color that are just like my struggle in the labor movement, but aren't necessarily about uh, strategy. Like we got to get in there because we've seen a lot of what's happening and we got to put these stories out. And so um, I, I just have a lot of gratitude also for the people who agreed to talk to us and share their thinking as they were trying to figure out what to do in this moment. And so, you know, similar to Sarita, we have a lot of uh, similarity in our backgrounds, uh, as it sounds like Margaret does as well in terms of uh, the relationship and the intersection between workers' rights and women's and reproductive justice. Um, you know, I didn't come from a union family. I'm originally from North Carolina. And one of the core things that, that really pushed me to get us to write this book was the idea that we can't build a more powerful movement for workers, a more powerful labor movement by simply talking to the people who already have access to 20th century collective bargaining, that we have to actually build power by talking to them too, but also really spending a lot of energy on people who don't have access or haven't had access and want it. Uh, and that uh, what are the strategies then that are allowing uh, everyday people to be able to come into this this space to organize and collectively bargain. Um, beyond that, I want to like that was already important, and in some ways, like that's why I was at Jobs with Justice, which I'm very proud of. But um, there was still a little bit more that that made me feel like I wanted to work on this pretty extensive project, uh, despite having newborn and and COVID and all the things, um, you know. And that's that that this idea of democracy. We've been facing for the last few years what many of us will call a crisis in democracy. And some of us knew before others, and we won't go into like, you know, all the different projections and predictions, but I think we, are, we can agree that we're at a point where the majority of the country feels a crisis in democracy and feels uh, the polarization that has kind of taken hold uh, over the past decade or so. And um, it felt important in discussing that crisis to ensure that it wasn't just a political question, but was also an economic question, that this idea of engaging the majority of impacted people in decision-making wasn't just a practice of voting once a year, but was a practice that should be applied to all walks of life. And that our role as Jobs for Justice and in the world as a movement uh, to expand democracy was really in that economic lane. And when we started to think about it that way, I mean, and I feel like Sarita, you, one day I will be able to make up for the fact that I took you down a million rabbit hole retreats to like get into the, some of the history. Like, I don't know how I can make it up to you. Uh, I know you like gin, I think it's gross, but whatever, we'll figure it out. But like, like I, you know, when we framed it that way, we then went down the history of like, Okay, so then when was the last time we were thinking about these questions? When was the last time things were polarized? And in that process, I in particular felt incredibly affirmed and validated to think about this, not through the lens of what some of our peers said, it hasn't been this bad since the Reagan era, or, you know, we need a new New Deal, or if only we could get back to the way things were in the 50s. And I was like, no, nah, it doesn't really speak to me and my family in the same way that it might speak to you. But um, it, it was really affirming to then go back to what there was a W.B. Du Bois quote in Black Reconstruction where he describes the largest strike in uh, American history when 
500,000 formerly enslaved black workers simply walked off the plantation. And uh, one of my favorite reviews of the book literally starts with, okay, who's in trouble? Why is this the first time I'm thinking about enslaved people as workers? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, because that's kind of a problem. That's our labor history. And, and I, I reference that uh, also because, you know, what you mentioned in your opening, Sarita, around this moment that we're in today, like this moment of, of extreme uh, polarization, particularly with a, a very diverse, very complex, but populist right. Uh, political wing and, and you know, uh, this question of what is to be done to build trust back in our institutions and uh, including labor institutions in that as, as schools of democracy, as they've been called by many. And so um, it was just really touching because one of the things that grounded me in the chaos of this moment and in not knowing what was going to happen next, literally the level of uncertainty of whether or not we can be in person or not, or whether or not I'll, you know, we'll keep jobs or not, and, and all that kind of question. Um, it grounded me to think about what it might have felt like to be an organizer, a labor organizer in like the 1850s and 60s. And, you know, and in seeing this mass exodus of black workers fleeing plantations, fleeing slavery, and trying to like, you know, on the edge of a civil war, right? And, and trying to figure out how to turn that into the promise of democracy. And, you know, in the second founding, what Eric, Eric Foner calls the second founding of like kind of helping to refound the country and perhaps build, albeit imperfectly, a multiracial democracy. And so grounding like the work ahead of us today, as we try to build democracy in the economic arena, leading with collective bargaining, it just felt really important to draw the, the lines between what's happening now with workers at Amazon and Starbucks, many black and brown workers, many Southern workers uh, who are beginning to speak out, not just because wages are low, but because they see this as their women's liberation movement, or they see this as their movement for black lives. They see this as their fight, how they're gonna fight for democracy um, and tie that back to our ancestors who, did the same thing in their own context and saw hope when it actually felt really chaotic. I wanted us to be able to write a book about the hope that we actually saw in this moment of uncertainty and that the hope wasn't coming from intellectuals or labor leaders or even like those of us who were paid to think about this stuff, but that it was actually coming from uh, women, many women and people of color on the ground who were just fed up and said, you know what, we got to try it. That brings me to one of the wonderful um, uh, gifts we got from being part of this writing journey. When we started the book, we actually were not clear what role worker stories were going to play in the book. And then anyone who's read the book knows it's a huge thread throughout the um, threaded throughout our book. And we really did, to that point, Smiley, we did make a decision to include story of worker, like the stories of worker leaders. And they weren't stories that were like, tell us the problem you're facing, and then that's it. It's like, tell us what the challenges and problems were. How did you come up with what you thought the solutions and strategies could be? And through that process, what it felt like to join together collectively with coworkers or community members to really push a set of demands forward and negotiate. How were you transformed through that experience? What were the lessons that you learned um, that in, in terms of your, like about yourself, about what it means to lead these kinds of struggles? And then the stories of people, them as whole people, not just workers, right? But that they have a multitude of identities and how that plays out in the decisions that they make and the risks that they're taking. I mean, I can't help but look, see Bob Bustle in the group here. And Bob's book actually really influenced Smiley and I around this idea of whole person organizing, right? And that was our experience as organizers as well, that when you actually center race, and gender, there's so much more that's possible, which is why when you look at the book, and these are all portraits of some of the workers that we um, interviewed and, and spoke with, um, they really bring to life what it means to bring their whole selves into the conversation about what dignity 
agency and joy means in their lives, which is the other thing that Smiley and I were really trying to get at is we'd been a part of a lot of the labor law reform conversations, Employee Free Choice Act and many policy um, conversations. And we just felt like often in the labor movement in particular, we get stuck in the process. Like, so if workers have the right to do this and that and this, and then we can do this and then they can have an election, right? And we were like, oh my God, we're, we're really not capturing the hearts and minds of people and the public and understanding why that's so important. It's important because people want to live joyful lives. And some of the workers we spoke with who really pointed out, um, you know, I, you know, I remember a time when I used to, you know, work in order to live a full life. And today I feel like all I do is live to work. And that notion that is frankly changing. I talk about this moment that we're in and the timeliness of this book because, you know, Smiley and I were very clear in these interviews, older workers were saying that, younger workers are saying that today. They're like, no, I don't want my job to be my whole life. And so we're going through a huge cultural moment right now, a massive opening. And we felt like these stories of workers really helped illuminate these ideas in, in real experiences and the transformation of why it matters in relationship to the bigger conversation about democracy. I mean, Smiley and I talk a lot in the book about how we have to get back into the daily habits of democracy. Yoni Applebaum writes a lot about this, but we've lost the habit of democracy in our daily living. Um, as we see a decline in people's participations in PTAs or church committees or um, other sort of entities where you had an opportunity to elect a representative and debate issues, let alone unions, right? Unions are the schools of democracy, right? Um, we realized that people needed to be reminded of the transformative opportunity in nature of being part of collective bargaining. And so one of the stories I always point to is the story of Dolores Wright. She's um, a woman we spoke with who we actually, Smiley and I approached her because she was a leader in, she is a leader in the Crown Heights Tenants Union in um, New York City. And we like really approached her as a housing justice organizer only to find out that she actually had been one of the original domestic workers who'd been organizing as part of Domestic Workers United and helped forge the first Bill of Rights for domestic workers in the country where they set initial standards. And she was so transformed by that experience. And she said, well, if I can do this in the, in the context of my work, why can't I do this in the context of my housing? Um, it was just a small but real illumination of what we mean by how powerful the act of collective bargaining can be on people. Smiley, what would you add to that? Anything around the worker stories? Yeah, there's a ton. I mean, I feel like, um, well, just to take a step back, particularly for those who haven't read the book yet, right? So we, we talk about expanding the idea of collective bargaining. And in many ways, what we're saying is we wanna get back to the basics that a lot of people who know about collective bargaining and don't just think we're talking about like a hot sale at the Dollar Tree, know it to be like a thing that a certain set of unions do like in order to like negotiate with employers or whatever, like it's a very narrow thing and there's a law that protects it. And like, it's kind of this thing that a small group of people do. And what we wanted to do was to get back to the basics of bargaining to say that that is true and that is very good. Those who can still get a traditional collective bargaining agreement through the National Labor Relations Act channels or militant action, like should we got to keep fighting for that. We got to keep expanding access to that. And we have to apply this mechanism for economic democracy to other economic relationships and also to new employment relationships that say didn't exist in 1935 when that framework was founded. And so the second part of the book outlines some of these strategies, right? So, you know, we talked about the history, you know, worker stories are, are throughout uh, the book that kind of helped to illustrate some of these, these strategies we're talking about. But like the second part is about some of these expanded bargaining. So we talk about traditional bargaining. We talk about uh, bargaining with the ultimate profiteer because of the way that the economy is so fissured. And we were really inspired by David Weil's work to really think through like what would it mean to not only have 
a bargaining unit that negotiates with the person who signs your check directly, but someone who is ultimately making the, the decisions and calling the shots at a peak level. And it was just fantastic to be able to talk to Cynthia Murray, who was active in that strategy as a Walmart worker, and uh, and Miss Betty Douglas from St. Louis, who worked at McDonald's and talked about how she was radicalized. And just one thing I want to say about Miss Betty, because um, she's, I still like, I mean, I try not to pick favorites, but like the conversation I had with Miss Betty was so powerful because, you know, the, the things that she was describing, the problems and like the challenges that they faced in order to ultimately talk to the executives at McDonald's and not just their franchise. Um, were so profound and like her situation that she was describing of not having heat or not being able to open a refrigerator because it's broken and not having the money to fix it or having to, to be, ride a bus and walk at the age of 60 something to the bus in the rain and, and ride for two hours there and back and just like it just to work like four hours sometimes her commute was longer than her shift and um, I remember the conversation and at the end of it I was like mad and I was sad and I just wanted to like you know I took every bone in my body not to just like drive to Lowe's before I had to fly back to the east coast and like buy a refrigerator and do all this stuff because Miss Betty could have been my auntie could have been my mom and uh and at the end of the interview uh I was like Miss Betty you know I, I'm gonna give you a ride home you know we're not gonna I'm not gonna make you take the bus home after this I've already called you out on a Sunday I'm gonna give you a ride home uh, just tell me how to get home. And she's like, well, let me, I want to take you around my city. I appreciate the ride, but I want to show you St. Louis. And like she, she showed me the parks where she took her son who was autistic. And she showed me the art museum that she was so proud of. Like Miss Betty had so much joy and resilience and a sense of purpose. And I wanted to bring that into the conversation because like, just like you said, Sarita, that there's a little bit of a so what that when we're in these movement spaces and academic spaces, we forget like the so what of all of this. The so what is for joy. The so what is that Miss Betty, by taking action, by interacting with the Fight for 15 and SEIU, felt purpose and felt joy. It didn't matter that her refrigerator was broken. It didn't matter that her electricity had been cut off the week before. She had so much joy because she was fighting and she saw her grandkids saw her fighting and that's all she needed. She was on purpose. And so those really inspired me, right? So Miss, Miss Betty's story, you know, I just had to draw that out because it wasn't just about how she worked with her coworkers to ultimately uh, be in negotiations with the ultimate profiteer, right? Uh, but that, you know, how there's also purpose in the fight. There's joy in the fight. You know, we got to talk to, as Reed already mentioned, Dolores, who was a great example of community-driven strategies for bargaining. And it's true, we were approaching her because we wanted her to talk through how the Crown Heights Tenants Union had really like such clarity around how they were applying a framework that was so similar to labor, but in the relationship between tenants and their corporate landlords. You know, in many of these instances are not like the mom and pop, like live upstairs, but are like, you know, LLC 457A, you know, you've never seen their face, they own buildings around the country, right? And so figuring out how to negotiate with them, not in a way because they think that tenants laws are wrong. In fact, the tenants laws in New York were, are pretty good, but instead of waiting for there to be enough funds to enforce them, they were like, we could enforce them ourselves through this type of, of practice. And we're now seeing other cities like in Oregon, uh, I think it's in Portland, right? Where there's a, you know, the municipality is even set up some level of mediation, similar to what we would see uh, between unions and an employer to help mediate negotiations and agreements between uh, tenants and their corporate landlords. And then the last theory of expanded bargaining or, or whatever, the third, is this idea of expanding the nature of traditional bargaining or what many people will now call bargaining for the common good, which has been really popularized by Joe McCartan over at Georgetown and, and Steve Lerner and many others. But really it's a, it's a simple idea and it's kind of the, the taking it back to social movement unionism. It's questioning what is the scope through which regular people can negotiate over and it, seeing bargaining as a site of struggle. So those who are still able to win a traditional collective bargaining agreement, bargaining for the common good basically says, okay, well, can we also now negotiate like what role you're playing in the community and uh, how this impacts people. And this is something that even the auto workers did back in the thirties where uh, they originally wanted to try to negotiate over the cost of the cars they were making in addition to the wages uh, that they made. And so 
the, the thing is to really think outside of the legal framework and to know that, uh, and, and certainly just to keep me on purpose, right? To know that like, I wouldn't be here if my ancestors hadn't broken unjust laws. And so it, it, we, we're trying to not be limited by the legal framework for collective bargaining, but to expand on it in ways that get more people into the conversation and into the discussion. And the last thing I wanna say, Sarita, cause like this is where I feel like I learned a lot from you when we were writing this book is, you know, the, the last section is really thinking about the future of work and the future of, of workers within it. And um, it, it hit home this notion of needing to just like get creative and not be confined by the current legal framework because, you know, we all talk about the gig economy and automation and just all these different technological shifts that um, have in many ways been used to continue to exploit everyday people. And uh, one of my favorite case studies that I think really was, I think it was one after the book, I can't remember if we even got to fit it in, but was where uh, domestic workers, like Sri mentioned earlier with Dolores and many others, who have been working on some of these new platforms to get jobs, to get gigs as nannies and cleaners, ultimately negotiated an agreement with Handy, the online platform for gig workers in the domestic sector. And uh, it ended up being, they used it to their benefit that they were excluded from the National Labor Relations Act and just basically negotiated a private contract that includes a lot of the same things that labor unions fight for in places like Kentucky and Florida and like not necessarily in San Francisco or Chicago or New York. And it, it just struck me again as like the powerful creativity and resilience of working people to figure it out and not just be limited by um, the way that it's always been done, but to really think through what is the future of bargaining that we need in order to have a, a healthy democracy. That's great. I'm doing a time check. Should we transition to Margaret or should, do we have a couple more minutes? Okay. No, that's right. So I would just say, um, Smiley, just on that last point in particular, that's why we felt like the book um, was so relevant today. I mean, not only because of the upsurge of organizing that we see happening, but because the debates that are happening, we're just in such a moment of great transformation right now. Um, we've certainly felt the impacts of globalization and the fissuring of our economy and the financialization of our economy that speaks to some of these points that Smiley just raised. Um, but it's also, in addition to that, there's, there's this moment that we're in right now where workers are taking immense risks outside of their union context. And so we wanted to really take advantage of this moment again to say, these are the different ways that we could be thinking about bargaining, but in relationship to the bigger conversation about our democracy and why it's so important not to silo out racial justice work or gender justice work, that actually it has to be central and core to the evolution of the labor movement. And, you know, we talk about it in the book as um, this is not because we should just be good allies. A lot of the story of the labor and civil rights movements is there was shared interest, but it was about being good allies. But we all know <laughs> that the March on Washington was about jobs and freedom. It was about the demand for voting rights and economic freedom. And we never won the economic freedom part of that. And so how important, and so we really try to lift up in the book examples of what's possible when you center race and gender, not only in the US context, but globally in terms of transnational organizing as well. And that feels really relevant given the gig worker conversations that are happening right now. I was asked um, a few weeks ago, like, what keeps me up at night? And really, one of the things that keeps me up at night is that we have a choice to make, like we can as like a nation, repeat our history and come up with a whole new excuse to exclude millions of workers once again from labor protections and social protections. Or we could make a very different choice, which is to be embracing all these workers regardless of their status and ensure they have the labor protections and social protections that they need. And I think COVID really cracked that open in a particular way. 
Um, and I'm really hopeful because I think it is changing people's hearts and minds in this moment. There is a cultural opening. I was sharing with Ellen that I went to a classroom and I'm so used to, Smiley, you're gonna appreciate this um, since we've both been trainers and, and, and whatnot, but you know, we're used to going into rooms where you talk about unions and you say, what do you think when I say union? And you always get the sort of negative stereotypes, right? Um, and all of a sudden in these rooms, um, these classes on campus, instead I'm getting, oh my God, the Amazon workers and the Starbucks workers and workers on campus who need a union. I mean, like people are thinking very differently in this moment. Um, and shame on us if we don't figure out how to meet where the public is right now and not let the limitations of our existing structures hold us back. And that's really a big um, hope we have of how the book can impact this moment. That's right, Sarita. I feel like uh, just to build on that briefly, um, that is real and, and it's palpable and both in terms of looking towards our future, but also helping to clarify the face of workers in our history. It is really critical that people today and, and young people today uh, get a full picture in a way that some of us didn't, right? That we don't just study uh, the, the white guy with the hammer, you know, the Paul Bunyan looking dude, but actually study the washerwomen of Atlanta and study the railway workers and the, and the porters, right? Like to, to really understand what labor history uh, looks like in this country. And um, we certainly tried to illustrate some of that today in our book. And I, I feel like you touched on two things that I just want to draw out before we get into the reflections. Um, the first one is the centrality of race and gender. And there are a couple of case studies in the book that we allude to that hadn't been completed yet. We certainly we talked about historically where centering race uh, led to victory, but we had projected, you know, that centering race and gender and some of the current fights would lead to victory. And, and one of those examples was the uh, garment workers in Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia, who had been trying to win a fair wage with the Asia Floor Wage Alliance and uh, with some of the multinational brands. So bargaining with the ultimate profiteer, going beyond their immediate garment supplier and trying to negotiate as well with those brands around certain conditions and had been struggling. A lot of the, the male leaders, a lot of these unions, even though the workforce is predominantly uh, women, a lot of the uh, leaders were men and uh, just hadn't been making a lot of progress. And the women, meanwhile, were facing, of course, like the people who were directly in the mix often have the best view. And, and they were really like organizing and mobilized by uh, gender-based violence, the gender-based violence that they're experiencing on the shop floor by managers. In fact, one woman, Jasari, uh, died as a result of some of the gender-based violence that she faced from managers or male managers. And so they began to organize these committees, these, these women's committees, focusing on this national campaign, on international campaign on gender-based violence. And wouldn't you know, they started getting the company to the table. And that's where it ends in our book. So then on April 1st of this year, the same day that uh, the Amazon Labor Union in Staten Island won a historic union election at that company, many of whom would admit to you early on that they were radicalized by the movement for Black Lives and the treatment that they were receiving as essential workers being poor, even though they were supposed to be essential uh, to the economy. On that same day, on April 1st, uh, workers, a part of those uh, garment worker committees, signed their first international agreement, the Dindigal Agreement, uh, with H&M and a series of other garment companies that ultimately uh, it led to some of the same types of agreements that uh, we would include in, again, like a traditional employer-employee relationship in that type of traditional agreement. But the best part is they went further. They actually included things like preemptive retaliation, where the burden is on the employer to prove that they didn't retaliate against a worker if something happens, if, if a worker is terminated or fired. Uh, and so it was just like this, this crystallizing of a moment of showing how if they had not centered a fight for gender-based violence, if they had not focused on the thing that was both motivating workers to take bigger risks, but also the thing that ultimately would get companies to the table because they didn't want to be seen as the people who were basically killing women in their plants, uh, that they were able to negotiate far beyond that framework and actually win an agreement, a historic global agreement, a brand bargained agreement with, with several multinational brands who, who historically have not come to the table. The Gap, I think, signed on later on. 
And then I think it also leads to this, this other question, again, getting back to one of my earlier points about the, uh, the, the road less traveled. Like I think that um, in addition to not just thinking about the straight shop floor issues and actually talking to workers about their whole experiences and, and in the process centering race and gender, we also felt the need to agitate uh, based on location, particularly in the US context. A lot of times you look at a map of the states and it's colored in red versus blue or a map of counties. And it tells you, like, basically it's just telling you who they voted for in the last election and, and somehow drawing uh, assumptions from that on whether or not they're right to be organized or how to address issues there, or how to speak to people there. And, um, and after seeing the teachers in West Virginia take action, uh, some of those ideas were turned on their head for me and, and for Sarita and me. And in fact, it was in one of the interviews with the teachers in West Virginia, we have Heather and Allison in the book, but we got to talk to a lot more of them uh, in, in being in, in Morganton. And you know, what we learned was that the first counties that walked out in that historic uh, action in 2018 were at the bottom of the state, like Mingo and Wyoming County and, and like the, the places that were some of the reddest in the state as the political map goes, right? The places that uh, did not even vote for Manchin, right? Like, like these, are, these are the conservative places. This is no man's land, according to progressive, right? And they were the first to walk out. And that was really agitational to me because I was like, what are we missing? Like, clearly there are people who have deep held values. You look at where I'm from in North Carolina and other Southern states about the promise of democracy. And they feel like our current institutions are failing them and they aren't necessarily wrong. And that it's actually a real challenge for us to begin to look at folks in some of these places uh, particularly the states in, in the map that we share, like in, in the South region, Appalachia, the South and the Southwest, where people have long lost, if they ever had access to 20th century mechanisms for practicing democracy, whether it's voting and political democracy or collective bargaining and working with unions and economic democracy, that perhaps they actually had more of an appetite and more um, of a vision and space for creativity than workers in other places where they've long been able to win. And, and one of my mentors actually recently told me, uh, you know, sometimes you learn more from people who have been used to losing and you have more ideas and creativity from people who are used to like being on the, on the underdog side than from people who've won uh, several times. And I think that rings really true for me in this moment as we're seeing workers, particularly Southern workers, black and migrant workers stand up walk off the job, simply walk off, just like formerly enslaved black workers walked off the job, walked off the plantation, walked away from unjust conditions, that we have to actually see this as an opportunity that's not just related to a tight labor market and the pandemic, but actually as a moment and an opportunity to take the country in a direction that further actualizes the promise of a multiracial democracy. That's great. Well, with that, Margaret, we'd love to hear your reflections on the book. <laughs> well, first, I just want to thank uh, you and Smiley for your extraordinary work over the years. We're uh, at the Wayne Moore Center have always thought that political activism is really at the core of democracy, yeah. and you demonstrate that in your work. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for bringing this book to uh, Oregon. And, uh, and Smiley was uh, on a virtual um, program with us last year, yeah. so to have the two <laughs> successive leaders of the National Jobs for Justice is like an honor in case Aww, you all there don't, thank you. don't get that. Okay, so I commend this book to you, um, those of you that are, that are listening. It is at the same time a big picture analysis of our political economy, coupled with a compendium of all of these mm -hmm. strategies and movements and workers in motion and and how, uh, and how we can use those uh, to better our future. So examples of campaigns that really rekindle and move us to a better democracy and towards more equality in the economy. So for me, the central thesis, as they have pointed out, is that we can use what we've learned in our uh, history of collective bargaining to expand this concept to uh, address more than workplace issues. And the, the second thesis and main uh, emphasis in the book is that 
uh, we need to take on the issues of white supremacy and patriarchy head on um, in order to really achieve a true democracy and a better life for all of us. So those of us that are in the labor movement have known for decades that we can't rely on the current structure under that is governed by the National Labor Relations Act to protect and improve wages and working conditions for all workers. There's too many exclusions. The workplace has exploded, the fishering and th that you mentioned. Um, and the current system favors workers to such an extent, I mean, favors bosses to mm -hmm. such an extent that it is a virtual impossibility to organize enough workplaces that we could have that transmission effect to all other workers. So many scholars and activists have long called for new structures of bargaining, mm -hmm. new kinds of organizing for workers and new structures. But this is the first time I have to confess that I uh, revis that I just rethought the whole notion of collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. I'm a labor economist. <laughs> and collective bargaining always was almost exclusively applied to the employer employee bargaining structures mm -hmm. that are governed by the NLRA. Yeah. and various uh, state public sector worker laws. But the term only has two words, collective and bargaining. <laughs> and there's absolutely no reason why we have to confine that concept to an antiquated law that no longer serves our interests. So, uh, and Smiley and Sarita give this concept a new definition that does expand it. They say that uh, it's a process by which working people can take collective action to negotiate with any entity that has power over their wages, living conditions, and overall economic well being in a way that produces a negotiated agreement that can be renegotiated as conditions change. Mm -hmm. And that last part is pretty tricky <laughs> <laughs> getting the negotiated agreement, but the organizing is going on already. It's in motion and it's there for us to say. This is collective bargaining and yeah. expand the understanding of that term and the use of that term and make it a, a, actionable mm -hmm. really at, at a community level. So they go on to outline uh, the many campaigns to, that have developed to improve economic well being outside of the NLRA structure. So, as mentioned, worker centers uh, to enforce standards for workers excluded from the NLRA, such as day workers, home health workers, domestic workers, transnational campaigns like the Asia uh, uh, garment workers, mm -hmm. social unionism and the bargaining for the common good, tenants unions and community driven campaigns that result in community benefits agreements at the local level. So these campaigns all involve forming new organizations and structures mm -hmm. that bring together often, many a time, uh, workers who are unionized and the broader and the broader community, uh, com community. And most, I think most of the examples were sparked by unions mm -hmm. because it is that, you know, it is that transformation yeah. that happens when workers become unionized and start organizing. Uh, and then they discover the inadequacies of the system and they inevitably go out to the community to realize their goals mm -hmm. you know, for like classroom size for teachers or That's right. uh, quality care for nursing home workers. Or, so to, re to reach their goals and to uplift um, workers in the broader community. They, they, so all of these campaigns you know, had kind of apply what we know from union collective bargaining, which is the key is to identify where the true power lies and then organize and pressure that power yeah. uh, through whatever means can get to them. Um, so that's how workers and community coalitions can confront not only bosses, but owners and government mm -hmm. officials, uh, landlords, mm -hmm. and whatever the issue whatever the issue is. So for example, here in Oregon, I think that the, the closest to my, the example closest to my heart is Pecoon, mm -hmm. the, the farm worker union that has used politics and organizing to affect every aspect of life for uh, migrant workers uh, and former and currently 
and uh, migrant workers. And Lynn here, Lynn Stephen is an expert mm -hmm. on that and has documented uh, the many ways that they have negotiated and won uh, benefits for the whole life of, uh, of their workers. Also the Portland Jobs with Justice mm -hmm. movement, which um, Sarita is particularly familiar with that have built effective structures like the labor standards boards where yeah. you have interfaith and uh, community leaders teaming up with the union workers to mm -hmm. enforce standards across uh, industries. Home health care organizing, we were the first uh, state to organize to actually be able to negotiate a contract for home health care workers. And we have really good coalitions around mm -hmm. uh, minimum wage and paid family leave uh, that many of you have uh, also been a part of. So they have given us a new framework for union and community organizing that expands this concept of collective bargaining beyond the workplace. And I, and I think we should really use that term, mm -hmm. collective bargaining all the time. Yeah. It becomes, because in their view, in their future, collective bargaining becomes the key to a democracy where workers have a say, not only over the working conditions of the job, but the terms and con economic conditions of their broader status, say as students, renters, debtors, you know, and the like. And so the second aspect of the book that is, is really uh, important and I want to emphasize is how it, 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 it re we must center issues of white supremacy and patriarchy in this organizing work. As Smiley pointed out in her participation in an event last year, uh, we are still fighting the Civil War, and we, we can still lose, uh, given the dominance of the right-wing populist uh, and populist notions in our politics. Most of the battles that we face stem from um, the racist and patriarchal roots of our government and our institutions. Our society is literally built on minority rule. Uh, from the beginning, our democracy and our economy have been ruled by and for wealthy white men. And we've never had a true commitment to equality from the three-fifths compromise in the constitution to the structure of the Senate and the electoral college. And the New Deal also was mm -hmm. very much the exclusions of workers from New Deal benefits and the NLRA really based on race and gender. And we've never adequately as a nation dealt with this legacy. And as a result, white, as they point out in the book, right-wing populism has captured uh, many white, uh, white workers. And in fact, right now, in this campaign right now, the right, several right-wing populists are openly arguing against <laughs> democracy. That's right. Which they say is mob rule and will lead to socialism. But we know that all <laughs> workers have shared interests and values that can be addressed collectively. Unions have always been on the forefront of interracial, interracial solidarity. Mm -hmm. Well, not all unions. Many unions <laughs> <laughs> have been uh, uh, in the forefront of uh, organizing interracial campaigns and also gender-based campaigns. Uh, Heather McGee, in her book, mm -hmm. The Sum of Us, that's the S-U-M, the sum of us, what racism costs everyone, shows that when you explicitly deal with race and working class each issues, white people are more likely to come on board. She talks about the solidarity dividend that exists when you center yeah. race in, in campaigns. And it kind of moves aside the zero sum thinking that has captured a lot of people um, who think that they are harmed by anything that helps black and other uh, workers of color. And so she also organizes, uh, also uh, argues for organizing for the common good as outlined by uh, Smiley and Sarita. So the most exciting campaigns in the, along this line of the interracial, the focusing interracial to me are the Domestic Workers mm -hmm. Alliance that, that Sarita yeah. has played such a huge role on. The fight for 15 mm -hmm. uh, that has been so important in the fast food industry and is yeah. now, and, and we have seen certain, certainly some victories on that front in the last couple of years. And the campaign, uh, healthcare workers um, campaign for quality care, 
all of these are led by women of color, <laughs> our two wonderful guests, and go beyond workplace issues to, to address fundamental issues of economic democracy. Because we know that in our democracy, really the workplace is the, one of the least democratic spaces mm -hmm. available. Yeah. People can yeah. check your free speech rights at the door, association rights, and, and, and uh, the like. And finally, I have one criticism of the book, and it's not really a criticism of the book <laughs> as much as it is a comment on our current reality. Um, you, you list so many examples of community-driven campaigns uh, and these new forms of organizing, but really not very many of them have yet to be scaled to yeah. have a multi-state impact or a national impact. Yeah. So we're still in the initial building phases of this very hopeful view of our future yeah. <laughs> with yeah. collective bargaining. The Domestic Workers Alliance nearly scored an important <laughs> victory. Yeah. They, their uh, outline, Asian Pu and the other leaders, their outline of how we need to consolidate all the patchwork of programs around work and family issues and domestic uh, issues were central to the original infrastructure bill that was introduced in Congress. Yeah. But that was the part that was cut off and we don't know, I'm pessimistic that it'll get back <laughs> in, uh, in during yeah. this, uh, the, during the, this uh, administration. So we, um, and I, but I'm glad you're at the Ford Foundation and you're no doubt <laughs> wondering how to scale these. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what she spends her day thinking about now <laughs> is how to scale these many, many uh, important efforts to bring union workers and community people together to negotiate for our um, economic well being and our democracy. <laughs> so thank you for leading thank the way you. and pointing the way. And I, um, I, I, commend, I commend you for this book. Oh, thank you, Margaret. That's great. Wow, Smiley, I don't know. I feel so um, grateful and heart, like my heart is full because it's really amazing to hear your reflections and to hear back many of the points that really Smiley and I wanted to make sure we're getting through in the book. So we really appreciate that. It's really great. Um, so Shall we open it up for questions, Ellen? What do you think? Yeah. Do you want to speak to the last issue that Margaret I, raised ab about? Absolutely. You know, or both of you about scaling up these? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'll just say really quickly, um, you're absolutely right, Margaret. And it's it's a conversation that Smiley and I have definitely been a part of, of how do you, how do you scale these models? Um, and we always have to remind ourselves, for better or for worse, we're in a marathon, not a sprint, as much as we need to be in the sprint. We feel the sense of urgency because it's people's lives. Um, but, you know, just like a small example of this, I mean, I remember when I helped start the first worker center, the first day labor center in Chicago, and this was before the labor movement thought it was a good idea to work with worker centers. And um, I was brought into the labor federation office and told like, what are you doing? You know, the day laborers are the enemy. And I was like, no, they're not the enemy. The employers are the enemy and they're being used. And, but the point, the point I'm just making is like what started off as these right. small it's really small movements in different cities and communities really have scaled to these national networks that are now really looking for the opportunities for the bigger um, set of demands and really pushing. I mean, I think the other piece that Smiley and I've said is there's one way to scale that is certainly through policy change and legal reform, which we need to do. But there is scaling through the actual organizing of workers and the negotiating with employers um, and other people who have power over the lives of workers that we have to keep alive. That's how we're going to get to scale on some of these issues. And that's what I'm hopeful about. You talked about Domestic Workers Alliance, and it's true. Domestic workers started from a Bill of Rights in New York to many Bill of Rights to setting up standards boards where there's a tripartite system in a few states to this major moment um, as uh, Smiley shared with um, the Handy Agreement 
to creating a benefits platform called Alia. Like talk about taking control of technology and platforms and saying, well, why are we expecting someone else to get it? Why don't we build the technology we need to actually provide benefits for workers? If we can get to a place where we see more of that happening across industries, I think um, that's what we're banking on. So you're, you're absolutely right. It is a, it's a, it's a vulnerability that we, we hope to work through. Smiley, you know, would anything? I yeah, I don't know if it's a vulnerability or if it's like your earlier point about a marathon versus a sprint. And there's, True. I want to say like two things on it, right? Like one of my mentors, I have lots of mentors. Uh, we stand on broad shoulders three to nine. I, I'm going to credit <laughs> some of them here, but like, you know, one said was like, Yes, it's true. Like what Dr. King said, the arc of justice or the arc of history is long, but bends towards justice. But also never underestimate how quickly things can change. And in the question of scalability, I mean, we're seeing it right now. It's almost like the difference between kind of the staff led, perfectly planned, organized, linear, this is how we build it to scale versus when workers actually realize that they have power and take action on their own, which is actually Starbucks. what we're seeing, right? Like I've, it's not like there was yeah. a national strategy for Starbucks, like it popped off, I, you know, in, in Buffalo, right? Like things like popped off and there are certainly some really smart leaders behind it, some veteran organizers behind it, right? But like that that fire caught, um, or I guess the whatever, the field caught fire. It was, it was a really big um, moment where we saw like spontaneous action led by workers. The other thing I feel like, and again, just goes back to what I said in the beginning is like, you know, I appreciate the agitation for scale always, right? Like, I mean, certainly there have been times where it's been used as like a kind of a way of, of squashing innovation. But like in this context in particular, Margaret, I think you're right, is like, how do we think about the implications of scale? And I want to just be like even more scalpular about it because there's scale as in everyone is doing the same strategy or trying to win the same demand or issue. And then there's what, you know, our colleague Socket Sony always trained me in flashpoints, right? There's a scale that comes from when you redefine what's possible, like the scale of the U.S. women's soccer team, like showing that equal pay for equal work can happen. What does that now break open for other sectors or the scale of what the women garment workers just won a multinational global bargaining agreement. What does that tell the existing global union federations and guffs and others is possible that they, maybe they didn't think was possible before or Starbucks workers and Amazon workers. The fact that the ALU won their election, they're an independent union using a traditional strategy. They won. What does that tell other Amazon workers that all of a sudden the, the, the institution that before felt invulnerable uh, now has cracks, right? And so I think that it's really valuable to think about scale in those two ways. The second thing, just getting back to the beginning of what I said, is, is getting into the mind of the organizer in 1850. Like we're all lucky, like we're in the future. Like we see what happened and like, you know, you overcame, you know, we marched, it was great. But like in 1850, all they knew was that like black people were being swiped off the streets of Baltimore and sent to like the South and the Fugitive Slave Act. And like people were getting disappeared and there was a war on the horizon and it just felt like chaos, right? And so I like to think about what's possible given this moment as, as similar in scope in terms of defining what will be possible 10 to 20 years from now to actually see our work as shaping the new framework. And in fact, I was in a meeting with a bunch of state treasurers recently talking about some of the Amazon work. And one of them was like, but what would bargaining look like at Amazon? And I was like, I don't know, like which of you is like the Francis Perkins that's gonna create the new National Industrial Relations Board? I don't know, like help us build it. We're trying to figure this stuff out too. You know, like have a little bit of imagination so that we'll set, we'll set the, the framework for it. We'll set like, you know, we'll act and show that it's important. And then, uh, you know, we need you to help build a legal framework around that. The other thing that we say in the book, and you began to kind of allude to this, Margaret, it's like, you know, this question of like power, right? Like power is not, um, it, I mean, it, it's almost like uh, it doesn't go away. It just kind of shifts. And one of the things that we're seeing now is that some of the power that historically has been reserved in say manufacturing or in uh, ports, like in Longshore, like productive power, is now in places like Amazon data centers or uh, you know, choke points along the distribution chain, right? And so now that workers are beginning to see that they have power, whether we call them essential or not, 
like they can now act in ways on that power. They can leverage that power for themselves. And it's an important thing to understand because that's what it takes getting back to this question of like worker led actions, things that may look spontaneous to us, but have really what we're witnessing are people becoming very aware of the power that they always had in a context that they did, hadn't had before to be able to see it, to be able to expose kind of the, the framework that we're operating under. And so they're acting based on this new power and, and you know, there, there are two things that could happen. We could, you know, see capital reorganize itself and, you know, put workers in a different situation. So we're confused again and don't know what our power is, which is like what Sarita was describing when we were talking about the gig economy, when we're talking about automation. Um, or like we could begin to, to capitalize on the fact that we have this power to win things far beyond uh, basic worksite issues. And this is why I'm really glad you brought up in your reflections this notion of um, you know, how the minority has never needed permission to rule, <laughs> like especially coming from North Carolina, right? Where my, our state legislator is a hot mess in terms of gerrymandering. And so like, but like understanding that if we don't have clarity as a movement of how disorganizing it is uh, and how they use uh, strategies like white supremacy or in, in this modern age, like theories like replacement theory to keep white people from seeing their, their long-term interests, which are very much aligned with everybody else. Like we will continue to lose, which is why it's true. Like I, I, Heather does call it the solidarity dividend, right? Like it's true that in the long run, when we actually are, are transparent and clear about these issues, not just with black and brown workers, but with white workers too, they begin to see their interests with the rest of us and see themselves in their future as opposed to this constant scarcity, fear of replacement, the same kind of, of ideology that drove the shooter to kill black people in Buffalo last weekend, right? This, this fear of being replaced and not having um, uh, the rule of, of minority white Christian men, right? Um, and so th the last thing I wanna say before I know we're going into questions is just getting back to the fundamentals uh, question of democracy and I, I, I know I keep harping on it, but like, I really feel like it's important in this moment to think about it in that scope, to think about a multiracial democracy, to think about the reconstruction, second founding amendments, to abolish slavery and forced labor, to define citizens, to expand on who can vote. When we think about those as like the lanes of democracy, then we actually have common cause with movements to expand voting rights, movements to expand organizing collective bargaining, student movements to control their fees on campus, or even to question just even the very nature of how we're boxed into these organizational structures through tax status, C C1, C or C3, C4, C5 organizations that can are limited in our activities because of, of this framework that's been positioned to us. Many of the groups that Sarita described when talking about the worker centers, when she seated the day labor center, in any other country would just be considered a union. And in this country, we don't want that because that means that we aren't allowed to raise money in the same way or we aren't allowed to participate in the same way. Like these are all actually a part of the, the same fight. The same people who are rolling back our ability to participate in these ways are the ones who, who are rolling back uh, organizing and collective bargaining. And so, you know, I think that we have a picture of how things have worked, particularly like our generation, I'm Gen X, right? Like coming from the 60s and the 70s and like uh, people talk about how great it was, but that, that generation also gave us a set of siloed kind of rights-based frameworks. And part of what we're arguing is that in this moment, it's not a criticism of, of what happened in that period, right? But in this moment, we now need a framework that actually sees much more of a united front and that we've seen workers who already get that. And I know we're talking about our book, but like, I have to just give props to Lane Windham and knocking on labor's door who like actually talks about the civil rights act of 1964 that Sarita alluded to earlier and the economic pieces of it that were won. It gave us the EEOC, it gave us the FF, FLSA, right? And how black, black people, brown people and women, many women who were joining the labor force in the seventies and eighties, this period that many labor historians call the lost period of labor history, which is like messed up because there were so many labor upsurges in that period, particularly by black women, black people and, and women and people of color, right? Like there's something about being able to, to recognize our history in that and actually to see the fight through the lens of democracy and this common cause and not just as these separate 
thing. Santione Butler, one of the workers interviewed in the book, literally talks about the fight for a women's bathroom on the shop floor as her women's liberation movement. Like if, if we continue to silo these things, uh, we'll never get to scale. And the victories that we'll win out of an upsurge like this will not actually help us transform our democracy. However, we are in an opportunity, again, back to 1850, not knowing that the Emancipation Proclamation is on the way, not knowing that radical reconstruction is going to happen. We're in 1850. We have to try to have an imagination for what our third founding is going to be through the process of building these types of campaigns and innovations. It's great. Wow. That was a great note to end on, on that. <laughs> Your turn. Who would like to ask a question? And I can repeat it if it's not audible for the people on the live stream. Yes. Sure, I'll go. Um, I, I really appreciate your idea of bringing the whole person into the collective bargaining process. And I'm wondering if um, through this process, you know, you, you're all talking about the big issue unions, I mean, basic livable wages and stuff. But, but my personal experience was within the recent resurgence in unionization within the nonprofit world. Mm. And I think you, we've been seeing a lot of nonprofit, larger nonprofits unionize over, over the last decade as, as they confronted patriarchy, frankly. And my personal experience was it was really challenging to find a union that could represent a nonprofit in the way that we wanted to, which was it wasn't so much about salary. It was about confronting the patriarchy and the decision-making process mm -hmm. in our culture. And you know, ultimately, you know, we did it, but a lot of the groups are unionizing and, and it is for, as you said, more of this whole person sort of concept of you know, creating a workplace that they're excited to come to mm -hmm. every day. And I was you know, wondering if we looked at that in terms of, you know, when I think of scaling, that's tiny, it's a very small world, but I really felt like, you know, even within the, the liberal nonprofit world, there are major problems. Yeah. Yes. Especially within the liberal nonprofit world in the United States. Yeah. And, and it looked into kind of yeah. uh, that level of, of you know, challenges to unionization, even, you know, mm -hmm. especially within the left. Yeah. I'll just say quickly, in case that wasn't audible, it was a question about uh, unionization in the nonprofit sector, a sector that's often, you know, uh, it's a very feminized sector. And mm -hmm. you mentioned sort of the the patriarchal relations of the workplace being kind of a, a major central challenge. Mm -hmm. Workers can change their unions and do. So, you know, it was really, uh, you know, when I was in, you know, coming up in the union movement, it was the era of feminism and it took a while, but there are many unions now that understand what the gender wage gap is mm -hmm. that want that the, that how uh, gender has structured women's jobs and undervalued them consistently. And uh, there are many unions that I think get it and just keep, keep it up, mm -hmm. you know, keep up your organizing. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I, I, just to add, it is something we're paying a lot of attention to. Actually, in my capacity at Ford, we're doing, um, we're doing some research now to understand the upsurge of organizing that's happening in the nonprofit sector and where the gaps are to support, to your point, the ability to address a broader range of issues um, beyond what is permissible around the bargaining table. And so we're trying to understand what that looks like. And also that in the nonprofit sector, um, organizing in the nonprofit sector is not the same as organizing in the for-profit sector. And so having the kinds of sort of <laughs> lawyers and supports and like systems and this idea of interest-based bargaining versus what you might do um, in a more for-profit adversarial relationship. Like, so there's, we're trying to do some learning like in real time around what are, how do you strengthen that sector of organizing that's happening? And I don't have clear answers yet. I think we're scratching our heads because honestly, um, it's, it bumps up against, of course, the realities of um, the attacks on the public sector exactly. and the resourcing. Um, and so how you, again, tell the story of this work mm -hmm. as like, yes, there are workers in the nonprofit who are organizing for these reasons, and it's connected to these bigger decisions and yeah. really like 
strategic attacks on the public sector that is connected again to this conversation about our democracy is what's going to be really important to thread um, as we as we see more of this organizing in the sector. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I it's interesting. I have mixed feelings about it. I'm just going to be honest about that as as like a, a both a, a director and like a uh, in the nonprofit sector and, and uh, you know, we have a staff union at our organization, which is fantastic. Um, you know, but the mixed feelings come in, in the form that on the one hand, you know, everyone who wants to have a union should organize and be able to have a union, like bar none, that's hands down. And I, but I think that the nature of the relationship between staff and nonprofit managers is, it just has to be different. Um, because of the point that Sarita, you made that um, it's one thing to be in a, uh, an exploitive relationship where someone is profiting off your labor. By design, that's not actually what's always happening in the nonprofit sector. Now, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a union and that there shouldn't be accountability, transparency, labor management relationships, even in a cooperative setting where there is technically no official manager, that there should be some way of, of of organizing and unionizing and making sure that interests, the interests of workers are met. But it is different, the issues are different. And the thing that uh, sometimes uh, gives me pause is when uh, uh, staff unions forming in nonprofit sectors organize with the vigor or, or see this as the fight or as their outlet to kind of express uh, the same types of frustrations that workers in um, say at Walmart are facing. And like, for example, just to be really concrete, and I can say this, I feel like Sarita, maybe it'll be a struggle for you, but I'm going to go, I'm just going to say it and you can blame me and people can totally bash me on Twitter or whatever. But, um, but like, like this question of like a four day work week, which has come up in a lot of nonprofit uh, negotiations, right? And like, um, it's an interesting question, right? We're living in a pandemic, like people are exhausted, people are stretched. No one should be worked to the point of like illness, right? Like there's a lot of, uh, of, of, good solid reasons behind the demand and the idea. And at the same time, like we're, at least like when I think of our context of Jobs for Justice, we're fighting for workers like Miss Betty, who has a seven day work week and sometimes has a commute that's longer than her shift. And in my mind, I'm kind of like, until workers who are in the front lines are making like a movement call for a four day work week, just like they made a movement call for the weekend in the early part of the 20th century, um, it, I don't know that the, you know, that the nonprofit sector should be on the vanguard of that. In some ways, we're a very privileged sector. And so um, there's, there's got to be a balance between uh, ensuring that people in nonprofit sector are, ex are not exploited and a balance between understanding the broader movement context in which we're living and organizing in. And the last thing I'll say to it, and I kind of alluded to this when I started talking about like tax status, right? tax status and C3, C4, C5, like, you know, Jobs with Justice was, was put in one of the Chamber of Commerce's reports a few years back saying that we should call them a union. And it wasn't because the Chamber of Commerce suddenly thought that unions were good. It was because they knew that by labeling us that way, they would gut our, our income and really limit our ability to function given the type of work that we do uh, as a nonprofit. And so I like want to mention this because I feel like this framework of, of nonprofit sector versus like unions versus whatever has actually been weaponized in a way that distracts us from the real exploiters in the economy in this moment. And you know, when we think about our ancestors who organized pre 501c3 organizations, right? Like they did it because that was how they participate in democracy. If they were able to get paid for it, they were grateful. But like, you know, that was that was rarely their actual job, right? Or if they got paid for it, the, the payment came from workers. And I remember in one organization, like the Unemployed Workers Union in the 30s, or or even like the Jewish Women's Organization, which was huge in New York in the 30s, right? It was like like you couldn't make more than like the highest paid worker and some unions still today have that cap like in their agreements right like you're like the idea that you were considered a functionary of the movement and not like a, a someone who worked for say ford motor companies or whatever was it was just a different dynamic and so that's not to say that uh we shouldn't get paid like i'm very clear of like our we're products of our situation right now uh and, and this is like we have a very large kind of swollen nonprofit sector in many ways, but one of the promises of unions and the promises 
of what we're trying to articulate in expanded bargaining is to actually build a movement that uh, we pay for that uh, either through like we have access to our taxes, we have access to fair wages, like unions have a revenue stream that comes from their members, which also keeps them accountable like that in itself is a practice of democracy. And so in some ways, like I'm, I am trying to organize myself long term out of a job because I would love to just, you know, have a have a, a social safety net and a wage that pays me well so that I can participate in democracy without having to uh, uh, in some ways like be distracted by um, some of the the focus of my my work specifically in the nonprofit sector. So maybe controversial. I just want to raise it up because the framework itself, I think, sometimes confuses us about what's happening. As someone who's been called Rob Walton uh, by a staff person who didn't want to, um, you know, who felt like they should be paid, you know, more than than frankly than me and many um, building trades workers, you know, um, I think that there there are um, ways to have healthy labor management relationships in this sector that are very different than what we might see in a, a private sector relationship where there's someone who is actively making, you know, like a Jeff Bezos who made $20 billion just in the first three years of the pandemic by exploiting workers' labor. We have time for perhaps one or two more questions. Yes. You've you been uh, emphasizing expanding collective bargaining, which I think is great. And if I go back a couple of decades to the writings of somebody like Kevin and Clower, Mm -hmm. They argue that there are some groups who are only going to make progress through disruptive behavior. Mm -hmm. And in confronting the race question right now, whether intended or not, there has been disruptive behavior, which you could argue has led to some gains and some pushback. What would you see as the juxtaposition when you look at the future of labor between what the, you've been presenting and disruptive behavior? Mm -hmm. Okay, and just to repeat quickly, for those of you on the live stream, it was a question about the work of Francis Fox Piven and Richard Cloward, who analyzed the New Deal, as well as I think labor movements in the post-World War II period, and emphasized the importance of disruptive behavior on the part of working people, that that was a route toward um, uh, so making gains because they recognize labor or unemployed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the example would be unemployed people during um, yeah. uh, during the nineteen during the Great Depression, for example. Yeah. And the question is about that emphasis in light of your ideas about expanding collective bargaining. Great. Did you want to take another question too, or I just well, wanted to see, we'll see. you tell me because we can do there, a couple. Was but. there another question? Maybe we can weave them together. Yes. Hi, yes. Um, I have a question. I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit on the role that maybe domestic uh, collective bargaining movements or working rights movements help things inspire movements abroad and vice versa. Sure. Um, Okay. Yeah. And so that's about the relationship between workers' movements within the United States, outside of the United States, and how they impact one another. Great. Um, Smiley, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I kicked well, us off the last couple of times and I'll... Yeah, yeah. I can kick us off and then try to be briefer than I've been. I apologize. I'm, I'm Southern and, and it's just not a strength to be brief, um, but I'm going to fight for it. So on this question of disruptive action uh, and the role like how to emphasize it in the context of this frame, new expanded framework of collective bargaining. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we actually cite like Ira Katz-Nelson's uh, uh, fear itself, right? And, and noting that even in the year following the passage of the Wagner Act, uh, three quarters of the people who won unions that year won it through militant action and strikes, only one third won it through, uh, you know, going through the election process. And so, um, you know, we have a, a saying that we, we use in the JWJ organizing training that's never give your power away. And so there's process, which ultimately like will codify a fight, but you still have to have the fight. And, you know, I was in a conversation with some of the worker leaders in the union in Alabama that's been fighting for recognition from Amazon. And even they were talking about like, we have to act like a union. Like we have to start talking through what we need. We have to organize ourselves. We can't just wait for someone to tell us we're a union, we can't just wait for Amazon to come to the table, we got to be ready for when we finally get them to the table. And that requires militant and disruptive action. And so, you know, I think that's a, a critical piece. And I agree with with Francis Fox Piven and many others 
on that issue, not just for people who are in the workplace, but also for unemployed workers. And, and we've seen unions in this period of COVID has been really telling, right, where pe many people lost their jobs. Some sectors were deemed essential and were overworked. Other people were deemed unessential and lost their jobs. I think Unite here in the hospitality sector lost almost like 90% of their base like overnight. But one of the things that they did that I felt was really profound, they're now back up to, I think, 60, 70% of their membership base back working, right? But like they kept, they those members were still Unite Here members. They were unemployed members. They were laid off members, but they were still members. They were still fighting for uh, to ensure that whatever benefits or relief that the companies got uh, through the context of, of the various packages that were moving through the, through Congress, that they were paid to either keep workers on payroll or to fund workers' health care or to like you know ensure that they had first right of return when it was safe to go back. That they kept organizing, and that's why now they can be back. So many of them can be back in employment and still back in their union relationship without a level of disruption in that practice. And so that also requires creativity and uh, constant action. Another thing we like to say in our training is that. Action is the oxygen of our organizations. If you don't have oxygen, you're not breathing, you're, you're dead. And so as a movement, we're seeing a moment where people are beginning to get back into motion, like right, like a body in motion stays in motion and to get back into the spirit of, of putting some oxygen back into our movement so that we can continue the fight and continue disruption. The last thing I wanna to say to it is, again, getting back to this question of power, which I can't claim, right? So Be we, you know, Beverly Silver and Forces of Labor, another, I'm just like selling everyone else's book but our own. Uh, buy our book too, please. Uh, but, but like in Beverly Silver's book, and this is not like, didn't come out recently, right? But you know, she talks about the different forms of power, how you, know, you can have productive power, which doesn't require a lot of people, but really requires the ability to stop production, right? So in the Smithfield fight, it was really important that they had workers on the in the slaughter floor because that would stop the whole chain if they were invested in the union, right? And um, you know, likewise, she talks about marketplace power and the power to control uh, the skill set in a particular market, which has been traditionally applied, say, to like building and construction trades, right? But like certainly in this moment of a labor shortage, we're seeing it uh, expand to many more sectors, and we see workers exercising. Uh, power that's based on their uh, position in the market, they're in the labor market, right? And then, of course, associational power, which just requires a certain number of people to organize in order to win something. So like in elections or a traditional union election, um, and of course, like in a boycott, right? You get enough people, you can you can Im impact the uh, ability of a, of a company to profit and exploit. And so this power has moved. And I mentioned earlier that like some of the power that had traditionally been, say, in some manufacturing sectors, it's, it's still there on a global level, and I'll come back to that, but that uh, in a U.S. context, it is at different times shifted, and we have to look at where those disruptions can happen, and we have to think about those disruptions with a nuance. It's not just that every disruption requires us to have this huge scale of people coming into motion. It may just be a very particular section of the sector that needs to act in a very, in a very specific way. Um, and so that leads to this last point around the internet, the relationship with like uh, global movements, right? And for many years, like, you know, those of us who, who identify as internationalists, right? It, we certainly had a posture of solidarity, but in a, a economy that is now global, right? In a global economy after globalization, global capital, right? Like it's not just a question of solidarity, it's a question of survival. And if we aren't actually coordinating with partners across uh, country boundary in a way that's setting the same bargaining demands, the same goals, the same strategies, in a way that understands where there's leverage in manufacturing, like in the garment sector that we've been talking about a couple of times, versus where we have leverage, say, uh, in the U.S., like as, as buyers and as like the people who sell those goods, like then we will consistently lose. And, and we're now seeing victories, right, cross-country victories, just like, again, in the Denegal Agreement, where uh, organizing across uh, country lines and country boundaries actually gets the job done.
or strikes happening. So there's, it's really interesting. Uh, in the next few years, I think we're going to see more militant and direct action on some of those fronts. And then on the U.S. global movements, just to say, in addition to everything Smiley just said, I think it's really important to know that a lot of we were very lucky to be part of traveling with many worker centers about 15, 20 years ago and going to the global south and actually being inspired by the organizing in the global south and what was happening and organizing informal workers, workers who are often left out of these protections. We were there with iGen, with Mariana from Domestic Workers, with Day Laborers, with many others and learned a lot of those strategies and brought them back to the US. So I just wanna be clear, like the US can inspire, but actually we have a lot to learn from the rest of the world on, on these kinds of like more um, expansive notions of bargaining and uh, strategies. Thank you so much. Yeah. Congratulations on your new book, The Future We Need, Organizing for a Better Democracy in the 21st Century. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank um, Erica Smiley, Sarita Gupta, Margaret Halleck for joining us today. And thank you. Thank you.